everyone. Welcome to prayer meeting. I have a... That's what the church is every time we meet, isn't it? Hello? My house shall be called a house of prayer. What the problem is, it gets used for everything else. And not enough for prayer. Why am I bringing that subject up? I've gotten a letter from uh, Franklin Graham, which is actually addressed to, to me, but also to our church. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read it. Dear friend, our church is, our country is in trouble and we haven't, like we haven't seen in our lifetime. As you know, we have no hope outside of God. We will not make it unless God's people call on his name for help. I would like to ask you and your church to join me and my family and thousands of believers in just a few short weeks for a prayer meeting March 2020 in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, September the 26th. We will meet at noon at the Lincoln Memorial and make our way to the Nash, up the National Mall to the U.S. Capitol praying as we go. We will stop at key locations to ask God to heal the divisions in our nation, guide our leaders, protect our religious freedoms, and pour out His Spirit on America. Let us come together and show all of Washington and the nation that the Church of Jesus Christ believes in the power of prayer and that we need more of God in America, not less. Will you stand with us in calling out to God and praying for our nation that they will turn to him? The Lord was moved by prayer for the land, 2 Samuel 24, 25. Will you join me on September the 26th? I hope you'll fill a bus with your church members and join us in Washington, D.C. as we ask the Lord to intervene. May God bless you and may God bless America, Franklin Graham. Amen. Amen. Um, I haven't had time to investigate all the details about this, but let me tell you what I'm doing. I put a sign-up sheet at the guest register out there in the hall. If you're interested in being one of those people who want to go with us to Washington for this prayer meeting, if you'll put your name on there, once I find out the cost of the transportation and the rooms there, and uh, get a, I can give you a kind of an idea about the meals as well and figure out what it would cost, then I will call you back and let you know and we'll find out if there are enough people to fill a van or a couple of vans and uh, we will go to Washington and join uh, Dr. Graham in this prayer for America. We want him to know that we're supporting what he's doing and uh, we want uh, the, the power of our prayers to be added to the power of thousands and thousands of Christians from all around the United States joining together for prayer. This is not a political meeting. It's a prayer meeting. And uh, we just need to, to think about uh, what we can do and if we can make it. It's on a Saturday, the 26th. So probably we will need to leave a couple of days earlier than that. A day to get there. You want a day to recover before the <laughs> prayer meeting and then, then to march up the mall. Uh, I think you'll be able to see some things in Washington during that, during that rest day and then come back on Sunday morning, drive back, and we'll have church in the vans on the way back. But uh, for those who are interested in going, if you'll just sign your name out there, and then I'll call you back and uh, after I get the details of what the cost will be and get it worked out. But uh, I think we ought to, uh, this is what I say as a pastor, not as a church. I, I, I think we ought to join Dr. Graham and uh, join our fellow Christians from around the country in this great prayer meeting. And if you can at all go, I think you need to consider it and sort of work the details of it out. And uh, we'll find drivers, we'll work it out. And it takes just about a day to get over there and about a day to get back. And uh, it, 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 we'll stop along the road, we'll be careful with people who have meal requirements and uh, dietary problems, we'll try to deal with all of those as well. But I think we could do that at a reasonable price and get people over there and get them back. And I know my way around Washington pretty much actually better than I know my way around uh, Indianapolis <laughs> and uh, I know we'll, we'll have a, uh, be able to find what we need to and do the things we need to but I'm looking forward to joining him for that prayer meeting so I wanted to make that announcement before the service started. Brother Tim. I have just a few other announcements I want to add to that. If you have a bulletin can you wave it for me? Make a little noise. Look at all those bulletins. That's great. Open it up. 
there's lots of announcements in there. I want you to fold it in half like that and take it home and put it on your fridge and you can read it all day long. Or if you're you know, one of those millennials, you can take a picture of it on your phone back in front and you can make that your lock screen and your home screen. I don't know if that'll work. Christmas choir is beginning, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday following that. And as I'm looking at our choir behind me this morning, I'm wondering if the congregation needs to start sitting there and the choir sit out there. We could just reverse the sanctuary because I feel like there's more people behind me than there is in front of me this morning. Not so, that's an exaggeration. Find all, all the uh, announcements in the bulletin this morning. We're looking forward to our revival in October. That's going to be preceded one day by a prayer seminar by Dr. Shaver. You want to be there for that. So put it on your calendar now so nothing conflicts with it. Alabaster is coming at the end of September. And uh, that's always a competition between the men and the women. I don't know if, I'm just going to leave it right there. I'm not really going to touch it today. If others want to, they can. <laughs> I, I do have a message from our missionary president. She did want me to give you a message. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'll give you my message instead. Uh, she said that we could start now if we wanted to give for Alabaster, that if you write a check and just put it in the box back there, just mark it for Alabaster, and please put beside that for the men's Alabaster offering and everything will be fine. Some of that message was from her, some of it was not. <laughs> but you guess. All right. Thank you, missionary president, and thank you, senior pastor. On a more serious note this morning, uh, for those of you who have not heard, our brother Leonard Berry passed away this week. And uh, the services for him are listed in the bulletin. The visitation is going to be tomorrow from 3 to 7. The service will be Tuesday morning at 11. Both of those will take place here at the church. And uh, we want to be as supportive to Cheryl and her son, Miles, at this time during their loss. So let's keep that in mind. Pastor, come open service with prayer for us. Let's we'll stand and join together for prayer. Father, it's a joy to come into your presence. We rejoice as we gather to worship you in this house and to lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to thank you and to praise you for sending him to save us from our sins. And Lord, we're praying that you'll speak to us today by your word and by the voice of your Holy Spirit. Fill this room with your divine presence. And I pray, dear God, that there'll be spiritual ministry that goes on today and people can sense your presence and Lord, find what they need. The, the scripture says that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Let people be fed and let them drink deeply today. And God will glorify you and praise you for the blessings of the service in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing out as Pastor Tim comes to lead us. I don't know where you stand on the issue this morning, but I feel like the church has been under attack for quite some time. Amen. Churches are being told they can't meet. Some churches have canceled singing. Others are just barred in different ways. And I feel like the church is under spiritual warfare. And I thought it would be crucial for us this morning as we gird our loins for this battle that we're in to remind ourselves of what we believe and who we are. So as we begin our worship service this morning, we're going to recite together the Apostles' Creed. Let's turn to page 8 together. Let's recite together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And let's turn to number two in the hymnal. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Oh, 
I know those are kind of antiquated songs. We call them hymns. We have a collection of those in that purple book in front of you. The next song we're going to sing this morning is a song that I had come to love through my years. And uh, it has several verses that we left out for a long time. But in our tradition here at Southport, we've added them back in. And the song simply says, our God reigns. 
No matter what others might say, no matter what the world might be thinking and what the world's philosophies might be today, a lot of them think that our God is one of many options. But I want to let you know this morning, God is reigning supremely. It's a fact because we know so much about him and he says that he's ruling supremely and he would not lie because that is not the God that I have come to know. And so this morning, my heart can say with surety, our God reigns. My God reigns. Let's sing about this.
my God. How about you? I'm thankful for the day that he saw fit in all of his wisdom and his design of salvation to send his son Jesus to become sin for me. All the guilt and shame of my life, every sin that I had committed, Jesus said, here, let me take it for you and in return, you live for me. And I'm thankful that I took him up on the offer because life has been so sweet and God has been so good to me ever since that day. That's my testimony this morning and it's bedrock sure. We're gonna go to prayer in a moment. I'm going to ask you to stand, Brother Dan McDonald, would you come and lead us in prayer? And I have a chorus I'd like for us to sing as we do. It's, He is Lord. He's risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And let's, let's orient ourselves toward prayer this morning. If you'd like to come and make a place of prayer at the altar, you're more than welcome to do so. If you'd like to kneel where you're at to pray, you're welcome to do that. But let's seek God together after we sing. He is Lord. You're the authority. 
You're the true and the living God. And my heart trusts in you this morning. And I pray this morning for Pastor that you will bless him, dear God, and anoint him. Give him the words to say. Lord, I pray that you'll direct him. And Lord, my heart goes out this morning for the Barry family. I pray, dear God, that you'll touch them today. That you'll help them. Lord, I, I never got to know him very much, but Lord, I am thankful, dear God, for the things that he taught me and what he that the things that he knew and how he and he, he quoted things and, and it was just want to be your man. I praise you, dear God, for that today. Lord, help us, dear Father, as we walk through this time that we might serve you on the strength that you give us. Give us something, dear God, that will help us to walk closer to you. For this we give you praise. Amen. Amen. He is And 
introduction because they have just well I gotta be careful what I say they're just fixtures around here they're good <laughs> they're dear saints brother Cook pastored on this district for many many years and sister Eva supported him and uh, we're thankful that they're spending their retirement years with us here at Southport I'm gonna have to get down here and turn the camera brother Dave so the people can see you the little people in radio land, as I refer yeah. to them. Yeah, good to be in church, isn't it? I hope so. I'm waiting, man. <laughs> but for 40 years, I stood by her, her and I together, and sang, and she kept me straightened out. I aggravated the bass player. Uh, he's got a new bass. His wife told him he'd give up his G.I. Joe's so he could get a new bass. So here he is. I think that's good. <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, I'm almost 80, and I'm like everybody else, I've never seen a time like this, never. It's been three or four weeks ago, we were helping in a revival, and uh, the evangelist, the pastor, myself and our wives were all together. I know this evangelist was uh, really, really sweating. He's a, I love being around him because he's bigger than me. <laughs> he's really a man of dimension. Good guy, good guy. But we left there and uh, he got sick and had to cancel the meeting. And they got him back up to around Chicago. And he's been near death with the virus. His wife got it, and then uh, the pastor and his wife got it, but guess who didn't? And I just thank God for that today, because I'm one of those I warn you about, you know? If you're over 65, well, I got that a long time ago. If you're diabetic, well, I've had that for 40 years. And if you're overweight, I got all that. But I thank God for it. I understand. It's okay. Oh, it's okay. But during all this time, I don't know what a song of all saying this. I don't know how many times. We all know it, except I still got to have the words. But this is a cry of my heart. And I know it probably is yours, so we'll cry it together with you.
Thank you, Reverend Cook. That's my own personal thank you for feeding me. Thank you. Yes, brother. Friday, I had to take a little trip into the hospital. I raised the hood, checked the wiring. <laughs> and uh, I thought I was going to have to go from uh, the magnificent center of stems to eight. Fortunately, I did not. So I, I'm not really sure. Of, I just ordered this in old age, I guess, in my case. But, <laughs> The pastor came and spent some time and her with me and for me and for the staff and everything was just great and so uh, I'm ready for another thousand miles to come on here <laughs> or whatever he has in mind but pastor tweeted to time out of his business schedule to come with me and, and pray with me and for me and, and for the staff. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate God's tender care and, and I appreciate the staff. And so all things considered, it was, it was, uh, it went well and I am most grateful for that. Praise God for answering prayer. Thank the Lord. Well, would you open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1? And I'd like to begin reading this morning at verse 21. Mark chapter 1 and verse 21. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. And the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. And as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her and took her by the hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed, and the whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases, and he also drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Let's pray. Lord, as we come into your presence, we know about your great love, that you loved us so much you sent your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. What great love you have for your own. 
We pray for this service. I pray, Lord, for mercy and for help as I preach. But I also lift up my fellow pastors all up and down Southport Road here who are taking the pulpit in this hour and preaching your word. Give them courage to speak as one who had authority. God, anoint them. Use them to preach the word with courage and open the hearts and the minds of their listeners. God, we need revival here in Southport all over the city. Please strengthen the church as we ask. We think about Brother Hal Hutton who has left us and become the pastor on the west side of town and we're praying that as he takes the pulpit on his first Sunday in his new church that, that your grace will fall on him and you will anoint him and he will speak the word with boldness and we'll praise you Lord for how you work through him to build that church in Christ's name. Amen. Next couple of days, I'll be um, involved in Brother Leonard Berry's funeral. I had a conversation with Leonard probably two days or three before he died. And he was talking about uh, some people who he knew who were, who he thought were pretty bright and, and well-educated and he, how impressed he was with them. And while he was talking about them, it was as if he were saying, these people have an education and I don't. And, and uh, when he was talking about him, I couldn't help myself. I just busted out laughing. And he said, why are you laughing at me? I said, Leonard, you're a poet. You're, you're a great reader. You're a man of letters. Uh, your education may be different than the people that you're talking about, but you're every bit as much educated as they are. Don't you understand that, that uh, higher degrees just mean you know an awful lot about less and less? <laughs> so that by the time you get to the doctoral level, you just know a lot about one thing. But you're a poet, you know a lot about a lot of things. It just, it made me laugh. I don't think sometimes in this world people quite understand who they are, but there'll be a time where who they are will be exposed in heaven and we'll all know who they are. Well, if I were gonna write a title for this scripture, I think I would write something like this, um, maybe a question, is there spiritual life after church is over? I've listened to a lot of cynics lately saying a lot of things about the church. They seem so free and bold. It, maybe that's part of the fire in my heart to want to go uh, to Washington and, and stand with Brother Graham. It's not to be in their face, but, but to pray for a change. And to, and to stand with all of our brothers and sisters around the country praying for change. They say that worship has nothing to do with real life. It's just something that people go through. They say holiness is something that you put on for service and then you take it back off as soon as you leave the church. I presume that some people do that. Don't you? I don't think that's the majority. The end of worship service isn't the end of spiritual life. It's the beginning. And the church doesn't vanish at 12 o'clock noon. Or in my case, maybe 10 after 12. <laughs> or 15 or 20 after 12. If we're going to be honest, we probably should be. It becomes the church that's scattered. It goes out into the community. And I think this is what we really learn from Peter as we look at him today. After we make a decision that we're going to follow Jesus and be what he wants us to be and we're going to go where he wants us to go, I, I think we need to realize that there's an application of that decision to everyday life. It affects everything about our life. And it ought to affect everything about our lives. When I was a new Christian, I hadn't been a Christian very long and I didn't know a lot about what it meant to be a Christian, but, but I remember sitting around with some of my buddies and and they were saying, well, let's go over here and do that. And I thought, mm, no, I, no, I don't think so. And then somebody said, well, let's, let's go. And I, 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 no, I, I didn't feel right. No, I don't think so. 
What was going on? It, it, the Holy Spirit in me was correcting the way I used to live. I didn't know that. And finally, one of them said, you know, we've, we've made all kinds of suggestions and you just shot them all down. I said, no, I didn't shoot them down. I just, I don't feel like I want to do that. Uh, our lives change. And the way we look at things and the way we think about things. And, and by the way, can I say quite honestly that it's taken the Lord a long time to, to work a lot of things out of my life? Uh, usually he works patiently with us one at a time and I'm thankful for his patience because I needed a lot of things worked out in my life. I, did, I didn't realize that I'd become such a creature of culture that my culture had so deeply impressed me that, that I thought that was the way that people live everywhere. They don't live that way. You know, you people aren't hillbillies. I mean, most of you aren't. You're from a different culture. And, and, and the other thing is, some of you were Christians from the time you were a little child. And so you don't know what it's like to be involved in the world and with your back to Christ and, and not caring about God or the church or anything like that. And suddenly finding Christ and what a radical change. I, listen, I've heard all kinds of people. They, they have these rallies and they'll bring some person to come and speak. Oh, you want to hear this guy speak, you know? He's been involved in demon worship, and he's a Satanist, and he's done all these things, and now he's become a Christian, and they want to hear about all the horrible... I just wonder sometimes if that isn't just brag, and if it doesn't help the devil more than it helps the church. I don't think that's the greatest testimony ever. I think the greatest testimony is, I got saved when I was so young, I can't even hardly remember how old I was, and I've served the Lord all these years. There's a testimony worth going to hear. It took the Lord a long time to get a lot of those things out of my life. I remember the first time I heard somebody insult the pastor after I became a Christian. Ooh, that didn't sit well with me. I waited until they finished their conversation and that guy started around the corner and down the hall at Old First Church of the Nazarene in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And I followed him and I caught him around the hall and I got him by his little string tie and held him up against the wall. And I got my face up in his face and I said, we don't talk to our preachers like that around here. And he was like, okay. <laughs> I thought, hey, I've already won a convert. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> A few days later, Reverend Hayes saw me in the hall and said to me, Bill, did you have a, I won't say the guy's name, but did you have a problem with brother so-and-so? I said, no, I didn't have any problem. We actually got right along. <laughs> he said, did you get a hold of him by his tie and hold him up against the wall? I said, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> Why did you do that? Well, you know, you heard the way he was talking to you. That was disrespectful and, and, and saying insulting things to you. And, and uh, I just took him around the corner and explained to him, we don't talk to our preachers that way. And he promised me he wouldn't do it anymore. So, you know, I saved that guy's soul, maybe. Certainly his nose. You're, you're laughing at me, but the truth is, I was just that way. I mean, what I didn't know filled a, a, a library. And I have to tell you very honestly, I haven't really gone way up the chain. But little by little, the Lord's taught me some things about life. And there's, there's things that I, I don't do anymore because I'm, I'm following Christ. One thing at a time, he's taught me because I don't handle two things at a time well. So one thing at a time. And so being in worship service is affecting all the other parts of my life. Let's look at the way it was here in these, in these texts. Let's start with the 21st verse. So Mark's gospel shows us that the very first thing Jesus did was he got his newly formed band of disciples and he took them to church. We're going to the synagogue, okay. And they all followed him to the synagogue. Uh, let me say a little something about that. Because we're living in a time where government intervention has just about destroyed the church Amen. and some of these I'm trying to remember that guy I was holding up at the wall and not do that some of these people 
that's kind. Some of these people who have been voted into positions seem to think that the fact that we have voted them into positions has given them special powers. You know, kind of like Superman. And so they're telling us what we ought to do and what we ought not to do and exactly how we ought to go about it. And I, I, I don't mind them advising us, giving us ideas and directions, but when they start giving orders, I start feeling like, look, uh, you were elected to serve the people, not the other way around. We're not your servants, you're ours. Amen. Now, if you are the king or the queen, then I can understand because I worked in a, in a commonwealth country for 10 years and I understood that, you're, that, that if you are a member of the commonwealth, you're the king's man or, or if you're a woman, you're the king's woman. Or if you're one of those other ones, you're one of those other ones that belongs to the king or the queen. Whatever the other 12 are. I've never learned that because when I was in school, they used to teach biology. Apparently they've stopped teaching that now. And so um, one of the things that, that I want you to see here in this text is that the first thing he did was he took them to church. Well, we've had a lot of interference with worship services. I remember one Sunday we had six worship services here and, and there were 10 people in a service. And we had six services. And in between the services, we went around and wiped down all these pews. Now listen to me. Don't be afraid. We're still going around wiping down all these pews. And you see, I still wear a mask when I come in and I go out. I, I just don't wear a mask when I preach. But one of those people who I was talking about earlier, about having too much authority and not enough sense, had his action committee tell me that I must wear my mask when I preach. And that was when the conversation ended. Because I don't have a lot of time to talk to stupid people. So I just hung the phone up. You laugh if you want, Tim, but they told me you had to wear one too. <laughs> yeah. I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's really not going to happen. I understand that, that uh, there are people who are at risk. And I understand people taking that risk seriously, and I take it seriously. I understand I'm in that risk zone too for various reasons. But I've been in a different hospital every day this week. That's not very smart if you're trying to avoid. But I'm a pastor. You know, you were talking about me coming to, to the hospital to be with you uh, in spite of my busy job or whatever. You, you is my job. Thank you. And, and, we, and we need to understand those kinds of things. Listen, folks, um, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. That's the promise of Jesus. But when we forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the custom of some are, that's a violation of the Bible. Now, I understand staying out when you're afraid. Stay out if you're afraid. Don't do anything that you think is stupid. Or dangerous. Or even worse, if you're responsible for people who are in a very high risk zone, don't risk their life by you doing risky behaviors and bring it to them. I understand those kind of things. But at some point or other, you finally have to just say, look, I, enough is enough. Two weeks has turned into five months and I've had it up to here. And I haven't seen anything that you geniuses have said that have really helped me. Not really. I have been told that I am unloving because I don't order you to wear masks in the service. I remember years ago when I came in to pastoral ministry in 1978, there was a time where uh, some churches were so strict that they demanded that the pastor go around and talk to women about how short their skirts were. So I'm going to run around with a ruler now and be measuring him lines. Kay would slap me in the next Tuesday for doing something like that. And I'd have it coming. If you ever hear there's been an assault in my house, you know who got who. <laughs> you might as well know who the, who the deliverer of the slap is. <laughs> uh, 
I'm not your mommy. I'm not your daddy. I'm the pastor of the church. I'm supposed to represent God and preach his word. And, and it's, listen, I don't think you should run around like five pounds of baloney in a two pound bag. I don't think that. But on the other hand, I don't. Is that wrong to say that? Okay. Like I said, the Lord's still working on me. Just feel good that, I, that you're not wearing a tie. But I'm not going to run around and tell people how to dress. But people often ask me, do I have to wear a suit to come to church? No, you wear what you want. I wear what I want. Amen. I wouldn't hear very long before some people got on me about wearing a suit. Well, I'm sorry. That's what I feel comfortable doing, wearing a suit. You don't like it? Get over it. <laughs> I'll get over that shirt. <laughs> I love those island shirts. I had three of them and my wife gave them away to Goodwill. <laughs> she apparently didn't like them. I mean, really, don't we love each other more than that? And, and not loving? Can I say this to you and you not get real mad at me? No, it's okay if you do get mad at me. Let me tell you something. When you're telling me that I'm unloving, you're not being very loving. Hello? I, I was at so many hospitals so many hours this week, I'm pretty sure I saw myself on Interstate 65 going the other direction. There he went. Hey, slow down, you're going too fast. Apparently I'd just been somewhere because I still had my mask on. I forgot to take it off. We, we, do need, we do need to worship, and as, and as quickly as we can, we ought to get back to worship, don't you? That's what, I, that's what I think. Now, when I was a boy, we had a saying in West Virginia that a rabbit will not climb a tree unless the dogs get too close. But some rabbits will climb a tree and sit up there on a limb. I've seen it happen. But as soon as the dog leaves, guess what the rabbit does? He comes right back down to the ground. Why? Because he's more comfortable down there than he is up there. If, the, if the, the revenuers have run you up a tree, as soon as they leave, come down. That's West Virginia talk. You wouldn't know what revenuers are. Those alcohol agents. Um, we, we have to have more Christianity than that. And, and I, need, I really need the worship. Listen, let me tell you something. You fed my soul this morning. Both of you did. I mean, that, that blessed my heart. I'm not a run around the aisles kind of guy, but I was thinking it over. I mean, really. You don't want a guy my size running at you down the aisle. It cause bodily harm. And so he takes his disciples to church. And they have him preach. And he preaches with vitality and authority and his presence there's a spiritual awakening that goes on in the congregation. Verse 22 and in verse 27, they use the word authority. Do you see that? Authority. He preaches like a person who has authority, like one having authority in 22 and in 27. What is this? Is it a new teaching and with authority? If any man speaks, let them speak as the oracle of God. We don't need any kind of namby pamby mealy mouth people who get up in the pulpit and talk a lot of nonsense and psychobabble. We need to hear what God's word is saying. And Jesus preached the word with authority because it's God's word and it contains its own authority. It stands alone when you're preaching God's word. You shouldn't preach it like some kind of a coward. And so he, he transformed the routine service into some kind of an encounter with God. Isn't that okay? If God comes while we're worshiping, well, we're going to church today. Now we're going home today. Now we're going to church today. Now we're going home today. Now we're going to church today. Uh-oh. What happened in church, you know? Seemed like the Lord came. And I got backed up on a couple of things and had to rethink some things. I had to apologize and ask God to forgive me. 
Give me grace to stop being silly and become more like what he wants me to be. Do you know all his life, John Wesley was plagued by, by new light. Did you know that? Whenever he got new light, he felt ashamed. And this is what he wrote in his journal. I sometimes wonder if I'm a Christian at all, if it took me this long to learn that. When I read that, I felt sorry for him. We shouldn't feel that way. If God's giving us light, it's because he loves us and he's moving us along. We should be happy about that and excited about it and celebrate. Good, the Lord's taught me something new. Now, yeah, it smarts a little. And so there's a service going on and, and things really get kind of exciting. It's a great thing in the congregation when Jesus comes. It's a day worth marking. And listen, it's so rare in the land now that we ought to celebrate it. And pray God that it come. You know, when I was a young man at, at First Church, it was a regular thing. I mean, they had 200 people that met in the overflow in the back of that sanctuary and had those, uh, you know, those collapsible doors. They, they closed those doors and they'd get on their knees in the back there and, and, and be praying. And when I was walking up the street, if I was a block or so away from the church, I could hear those people praying before church on Sunday night. What do you think happened in the services? I honestly was in that room where it felt like the presence of God came into the room like a tidal wave and it came from the back to the front and it didn't matter where you were sitting, where, wherever you were sitting, when the wave got to where you were, everybody went. And the glory of God came on the place and some people got up and ran to the altar to pray to be saved. People got Holy Ghost conviction back then. They felt bad about their sins and they wanted to get saved. You don't have to beg and plead for people to, to seek the Lord. They, they were delighted to. Why? Jesus was there. And it made a whole difference in what was going on in the place. You know, that guy had been sitting in that synagogue for how many years and suddenly Jesus comes along and there's a confrontation. And a demon starts calling Jesus out and he tells him, hey, you be quiet. I don't need your testimony. Sorry, I don't need that kind of support. And he cast the demon out of that fella. Uh, don't you imagine the conversation at dinner was a little different than it was the week before. You know, that new rabbi came in. <laughs> wow. He took the service apart. Today's a different day. It's the day when Jesus came. And he was whole. And he was new. And he was free. Because Jesus came. So what's the next thing that happens? Look at verse 29. They go home with Peter. Now I don't know whether Peter told his wife he was bringing all those fellows over or not. I know for certain he didn't tell his mother-in-law because she was sick in bed. Now of the two, forgetting to tell your mother-in-law would probably get you into more trouble than forgetting to tell your wife. That's just my experience. That's nothing about mother-in-laws because, you know, Naomi was a mother-in-law, and she was a great one. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think there, that anything lower about mother-in-laws. I just think that some men are a little dumb about notifying the, the important women in their life. And we ought to get smarter than that. That's one of the things the Lord taught me, you know, from my culture. <clears throat> and so Peter invites Jesus home, and so they go over to his home. And he didn't consult anybody. He just invited him there. And in Luke chapter 4, it says that she had a great fever, his mother-in-law. It's probably a good idea to take Jesus home with you from church. Amen. You never know what will happen. If, if he can make things happen at church, imagine what would happen at home. <laughs> oh, man. Could that ever stir some things up? I remember when I came home after I got saved, I walked in the door and my mom was reading on the couch. She was a great reader. She was reading on the couch and she looked up at me and she said, what's going on with you? And I said, what do you mean? She said, your face is different. And I said, I got saved. And she said, oh, no. Walter, did you hear what he said? And dad came in. Now, when dad was called Walter, not James, he knew he was in trouble. And so he came in. What's going on? And I just told dad I got saved. The church. Oh, no. They hated the idea. Let me tell you something. You bring Jesus home with you, and it's going to stir things up. My dad said, you can't go back to that church anymore. 
I haven't been a Christian very long. I didn't know much about the Bible. I just said to him, well, I know I'm supposed to obey my parents. I, I know that much from the Bible. But dad, is it, is it right for me to disobey God and obey you? He and mom looked at each other and said, we'll talk about this. <laughs> yeah. It was an uncomfortable few years after that before they got saved. But they both got saved. And my mother led my brother George to the Lord. And my sister Mary started going to church with me and she got saved. And my sister Sue started going to church with me and Marilyn Sue got saved. And one by one, even my brother Jim, who was the physical embodiment of the carnal nature on earth, got saved. And let me tell you something. You don't know what bad is until you... Well, and never mind. I'm just telling you, God's grace is amazing. Yes. Yes. And 20 years of praying for my parents before they got saved, it just seemed like to a lot of people it's never going to happen, but it happened. And they both prayed through in all places in Cleveland, Ohio. I didn't think anything good could come out of Cleveland, Ohio. I really didn't. Have you ever been there? I mean, you know what I mean. Hope this doesn't show in Cleveland. But. <laughs> they probably know what I mean. And so these Jews, being good Jews, were, were keeping the Sabbath. And along about sundown, on Sabbath, guess what? They show up at Peter's door. Some of us are sick. Some are demon possessed. And the scripture says he healed them. And he cast out the demons of the people. Man, you talk about a full day. I mean, you have a great church service. A, a guy gets a demon cast out of it. His, the mother-in-law gets healed and she gets up and cooks him a fine Sunday. Well, it would have been a Saturday meal. And then, and then the next thing you know, the whole, the whole community comes in. And there's a revival going on at the front door of Peter's house. That's not bad. When we bring Jesus home, he can make all kinds of changes. And let me tell you something. Sometimes at home, changes need to be made. Let me tell you something. There, there is a thing called uh, depreciation I've learned as a homeowner. And there's a thing called appreciation. And, and uh, I had my house. I've had it three years now. I had my house about a year and a half. And I got a notification that my house had appreciated Wow. How much did it appreciate? 12%. Whoa. It appreciated so much that the tax people appreciated it and they showed me <coughs> how much they appreciated it. There are things you can do to your house to make it appreciate in value and there are things you can do in your house to make it... I had the Beverly Hillbillies living next door to me and they moved away and this family moved in and you know they went to work and they cleaned that house up and they, they cut all that grass in that yard and they found a couple of cars and some other things in there and got rid of them <laughs> and, and got, that, got that place all fixed up and it looked like a million dollars and the tax man says, you know, that person's house has appreciated in value. And I thought, why are you telling me about this? Well, two of your other neighbors sold their house and they got more money for it than we thought they would. So therefore, that means your house is appreciated again and we need your taxes to go up $100 more a month. Hallelujah. <laughs> if I was planning to sell the house, that'd be good news. But I was sort of wanting to live and die there, you know. It'll be up to whoever the executive of the state is to figure out whether he wins or loses. You can appreciate the person you're married to by saying things about them that raise them in the eyes of other people around you. And in their own eyes. I'm not talking about lying, I'm talking about telling the truth. And you can make their value go up. You can say some other things that can make their value go down. That's depreciation. Now you married that person. And if you married that person, you married them because the two become one flesh. They're, you're one flesh now. When you depreciate them, you're depreciating yourself. So when you get through talking them down, my next question is, are you stupid? What do you mean, am I stupid? 
Why were you dumb enough to marry somebody who's as bad as you say they are? You better stay with them because you're not good at picking and you'll probably pick worse the second time. Have you ever seen anybody who get married and they get a divorce, they get married and they get a divorce, get married and they get a divorce, and they just don't learn? And they just get, get you know, right out of the frying pan and into the fire, and, and then they just turn the heat up a little more on the third or fourth one, you know, and it's, it's worse. And they, they, they just don't learn. You know, let me tell you something. When you get to that point in your life, you need to sit down and have a talk with yourself and with Jesus, and you need to say, you know, I'm not really good at finding somebody to, to marry and to live with, and I sort of need your help because... I'm losing it. You need to, to appreciate the person you're married to and, and then you're, you're wise, aren't you? And if their value goes up, guess what? So does yours. That's a good thing. When Jesus comes home and you start doing that, saying those kind of things, you know, because Jesus is there, you want to be careful you don't make, you know, a bad scene in front of him. You start holding your tongue. Hold on, and they'll say anything. What, you know, and listen, just because an idea comes in your head, it's got no reason to get to your tongue. Hear me? Yes. That's what, what? Push it down with your tongue. So get it down there. His mother in law felt so good about what happened, she got up and cooked him supper. Wasn't that great? Now, personally, from West Virginia standards, if somebody just got out of bed and they were sick and they had a high fever, the last thing you want them doing is cooking your supper. <laughs> that would be uncouth. How, how could you even imagine even asking them to cook your supper? No, no, you just sit down on the couch and, and I'll, I'll cook the, the, the grits and gravy here. Just don't worry about it. Because that's all I know how to cook. But then it turns into a bigger thing when Jesus goes into the city and these people come to the door and great things happen. Now, I would think that the average guy, having had that experience at church, and what happened at home and what happened at the front door of the home with all the city coming there, would be pretty satisfied. You know, we're having a good year. This is a good year. So they get up in the morning, they can't find Jesus. That's always bad. But they were smart. They went on a search. They found him. You know, everybody's looking for you. They meant we are looking for you. But everybody's looking for you. I want to go on to some other places. You know what? His vision is different than ours. It's bigger than ours. We, we talk ourselves down in vision. We can only do this or we can only do that. Or, or some little blessing happens or a little miracle happens and we think, oh, that's so wonderful. And it is wonderful. Let me tell you something. God works a miracle. Big or small in the eyes of man, it's big. God has stepped into your life and done something miraculous for you. Rejoice and be glad because every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven and you should glorify God for those things. But, but let me tell you something. That's not the limit. Do you know how you were saved? The power that raised Christ from the dead on Easter Sunday morning is the power that brought change in your life by grace through faith. And that same resurrection power brought you to new life. And if you think that that power finished with you, you're not thinking right. You need to grow up a little because it continues to work in you and wants to work through you to continue to bring about miracles. And so he said, no, I think we want to go a little farther in Galilee. Let's go to some of these other little towns and start talking to people. And, and, and that's what they did. It, it, it just expands our, our vision. You know, he was getting these disciples ready to, to, to take the gospel to the whole world. And their whole world was Capernaum. Wasn't even Galilee. It was Indianapolis. It wasn't Indiana. Get it? Or in our case, it wasn't all of, Wood, uh, all of uh, Marion County. I started to say Wood County. That's where I was born. No, no. It, this is Marion County. We may be on the edge of it, but we're still part of it. And we need our vision to be expanded. To let it be. Well, Pastor, why in the world do you want to go to Washington, D.C.? Let me tell you something. There's a world out there, folks. And you're a part of it, and so am I. That's why we're involved in missions so deeply. 
This alabaster offering and, and the jokes and stuff we have back and forth between me and the Easter Bunny, that's, you know who I mean. Our missionary president's the Easter Bunny. I mean, she's, she's so kind and sweet. She just looks like a little bunny. But actually, she's behind the scenes planning, you know, to... Well, what difference does it make when you take all these big... It makes a big difference. I've been on the mission field when alabaster money came in. It makes a big difference. Churches make a big difference. And, and it continues to echo for years on that field and have, have a, a real impact. We need to understand that what we do is important. Let me tell you something. It may not mean a lot to, to a lot of those snotty, foul-mouthed people on the news, but it means something to God when you're standing on the mall begging God to have mercy on our country. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and, no, not, the, not the news media, themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will turn and I will heal their land. And if there was ever a country that needed healing, let your vision get out there. And what happens if America gets healed in terms of missions and outreach to other countries around the world? Listen, when America gets in trouble financially, there are a lot of countries around this world that sink right to the bottom of poverty. And when we're doing well as a country financially, there's a lot of places where that poverty eases up and things get better and people get fed and other kinds of blessings happen. You need to understand the impact of this country and the world. We need a revival here. The world needs for us to have one. And the, the political leaders aren't going to stop that. They certainly aren't going to bring it. But we, we God's people, need to get our vision. You know, all the people in town are looking for you, Jesus. Well, forget about that. What about the rest of Galilee? Let's go out there. We had them at the door last night. Let's go to somebody else's door. See, when Jesus comes in, you start lifting up your head and looking around and thinking bigger than you ever thought before. And he began to affect the world around you. My sister Marilyn Sue got a tumor of the brain and she was being treated for it in Nashville. I drove down to see her and spent the day with her one day. And uh, all of her kids and her grandkids were around her and uh, I just took them all out to supper. One of those places where you could eat a ton of food, you know, because those hillbillies know how to eat. And so, Sue and I were sitting and talking quietly while they were doing what they were doing. And she said, just think, we grew up on that dirt street in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And here I am running 600 people for a telephone company, installing systems and businesses all around the southeast part of the United States. And there you are just back from 10 years on the mission field and have pastored churches all over Indiana. She said, we've come a long way from that dirt street, haven't we? And I said to her, Sue, it started at Parkersburg First Church of the Nazarene where we found Jesus. And he helped us to see things that we couldn't see from that dirt street. Let me tell you something. You put your feet on the road to follow Jesus, you have no idea where you're going. But I'm telling you, it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> be a little white knuckle exciting at times <laughs> yeah I won't, won't deny that but don't you feel good when you get off the roller coaster that's the only time I do feel good about roller coasters when I get off <laughs> in fact I enjoy that so much I just don't get back on them anymore <laughs> I've learned my lesson but I think he wants to give us a vision and to ignite our hearts. I, I honestly think some of you, some of you in this room, you've never been to Washington, D.C., have you? Is there some here you've never been in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, a lot of people. Well, it, it'll change your, your view of, of our country when you see it face to face. I'm not talking about pictures when you see it. It looks like the biggest collection of Greek temples you ever saw in your life all around you. George Washington said he wanted people to come and visit the president and be awestruck by what they saw in our, in our nation. It's that way. Still is. But I think going there and praying for the people who are in our government 
We talk about them a lot, but do we pray for them much? Pray for the people who are in our government. Pray about what's going on in our country. To stand among spiritual giants in our land who are walking with us up the mall. I think that's going to have an effect on your vision. And maybe on the trajectory of your life. I don't need a long drive to Washington and back. I've been around Washington, D.C. a lot. I know my way around there pretty well. But if enough of you want to go, I'll get you there and back. And honestly, listen to me. I believe that I will be investing in this church by doing it. Because you'll come back from that changed. And we'll reap the reward. Father, we want to praise you that Jesus went to the synagogue good and the things that he did there. That he went home with Peter better. We want you home with us. And he dealt with the people at Peter's door. Great, Lord. Citywide revival. Who could ask for anything bigger than that? But then he opened the minister's eyes and helped them to see that there were a lot of towns in Galilee. Let's go out and talk in those little towns. Lord, help us to be changed by being with you in church and to go out and change our home and then our community and then our world. In Christ's name, amen. God's blessing on you.